We started out at the beginning of September with 128 players. And more than three weeks later, we're now just down to the final two. two. And today was the grand finale of the World Cup 2017. Levon Aronian and Ding Liren have played four classical games, all drawn. There were lots of ups and downs, but now we're into the tie break. Would it be Aronian who wins from Armenia? He first won the World Cup in 2005. He would be the first player to actually win it twice in the history of the tournament. Or would it be Ding Liren to be the first Chinese player ever to win the World Cup? Indeed, the first Asian player ever to win the World Cup. So here we go. Two 25 minute games. And each time the players make a move, they get 10 seconds added as well. Aronian with the white pieces. And it's a Slav and, well, clearly Aronian wanted to play very sharply today. He often does play very sharply with the white pieces. Queen b3, this is quite an old variation actually. So white is hanging back with the e-pawn for the moment. And he plays e4. This was first played by an English player Victor Berger in 1926 and Aliakin took it up shortly after that to win a nice game and it's still played today. It's obviously very aggressive because White smashes through with e4 gaining a tempo on the Queen and looking to use this nice space advantage very quickly while Black, uh, Black's development, well it's not Black is a little cramped here, and particularly that Queen's Bishop. Nevertheless, it's thought that, uh, it was in modern theory, that Black should be okay here. Queen f4 looks a little strange, but actually the Queen does a reasonable job here. Uh, it can always dive back to safety, and it prevents White's Queen, for example, switching over to the, the King's side easily. It's all known theory. And in those early first games with uh, this line, then black often played, well, quite passively with bishop e7 and white managed to build up a, a, a big attack very quickly. But Ding played the approved move e5 and this fights back straight away. If black uh, manages to consolidate his position, then he can use that dark squared bishop. So that, that's why black is attacking on the dark squares in the center. And of course, e5 will at some point enable this bishop to enter into the game. So this is the approved move, pawn to e5. Aronian castled, bishop e7. And here, well, previously in several games, we've seen the move rook f e1. And this has worked out okay for black. For example, let me show you this game between Fresin and Fanveli, played in 2014. So white is trying to shift to the, the king side, but actually this move blocks out the queen and bishop. And here, well, Fanveli managed to equalize this position. But here, Aronian played a new move clearly prepared, play this after four seconds. And this is very clever. I know it looks slightly odd to uh, to move this queen's rook way over here, almost trapping in the rook on f1, but there is a very good point to it. This is incredibly dangerous. Let's see what happened. Pawn takes pawn and the bishop dropped all the way back to b1. So this is the point, The having cleared out the rook, then the bishop can drop back to the back rank and it won't be hassled by any pawn move coming forward or perhaps the knight coming into c5. And we'll, we'll see what, what an effect this has on the game in a moment. So Ding castled, important to get his king out of, uh, out of the way of the rook. Knight g3, so uh, Aronian is not hurrying to recapture this pawn, but He's opened up the e-file, that's one thing. This knight starts to look rather threatening on the king's side. And also 
he's cleared this diagonal so that he's ready to set up a battery with the queen on perhaps d3 or c2. So here we can see if the queen is attacked, then it'll just drop back to d1. And you can see that with the bishop way out of the way, then it's not going to be hassled by a pawn coming to d3. So this was the point of moving the rook out, enabling the bishop to come back to b1. And here, white has a huge initiative, although black is still a pawn up. The bishop is attacked. White may be able to play b4, push the knight out of the way and come back to this idea with queen d3. It's an extremely dangerous position for black. So here, instead of knight c5, Ding preferred to play the bishop back to d8, which, well, needs must. Um, but it looks pretty ugly because it's going to be very hard for black to develop quickly. In the meantime, Aronian builds up a really powerful attack. So g6 prevents the mate, but now simply h4, looking to break things open. And of course, if h5, then that could be taken. That's still not completely clear, but obviously white has a big initiative. Ding played knight f6 to try and, you know, put some pieces next to his king. But h5, of course, opens up the diagonal. Now, to keep the position closed, Ding had to play g5. Now, the knight covers the, F, the h7 square, but even so, the open diagonal, and in particular that weakened square on e5, uh, f5, look very unpleasant. Knight e5 played. So white pieces massing very dangerously, and now there was a big hit. Knight g6, just ignoring the fact that this bishop is attacked for the moment. So the knight hits queen and rook. Uh, it looks absolutely devastating. Of course, if that's taken, then the queen crashes through. And this is very simple. Uh, let's take a pawn and play rook e7 with mate. So Ding plays queen d2, and that's really the only move. And of course, if the queens are traded, the rook is still on, well, white can't win material. But a check is very strong, and just removing the queen, making sure the queens aren't traded, and now one of these knights is going to hit f5, and that is very, very nasty. Queen f4. Here, Aronian made uh, an error, actually, by his own admission. Um, he should have just crashed in with the knight straight away. He played rook d1, which is um, feels like it's going in the wrong direction. The point is, if he plays the knight check straight away, then he can just bring the rook down to e7, and this is really, really unpleasant for black. Instead, he played rook d1, and he said that he realized he'd made a mistake, and well, he said he had to had to go to the bathroom and splash water on his face just to kind of freshen up and stay calm. Um, and he came back and, well, luckily for him, Ding made another mistake straight away. He should play c5 here. Instead, bishop b6. And now everything goes white's way again. Queen gets pushed away. Well, if queen takes queen c7, then knight h6, and this is a very, very good position for white, obviously, having taken that pawn on the king's side, and the knight will just come back. And it's very hard for black to fight off white's strong pieces. Queen g4, but this is disastrous. After queen h5, Ding presumably had just missed this very simple move. So if queen takes, then the rook comes to h1 and something terrible happens on the h-file. So Ding tried d3 to close off the diagonal, but, well, things just got worse. Queen c3. And after the king came to g7, check. And here Ding resigned. Um, if the queen moves, let's say queen g4, you can force a checkmate. Which takes d3, the king gets clobbered in the middle. Fantastic first game from Aronian. And what well, as he said afterwards, 
Ding basically just got caught in a nasty piece of uh, preparation. That meant going into game two, Ding Liren was in a must-win situation. He did have the white pieces. Ronin didn't back down. He played dynamic Ragazin system, which can lead to very double-edged positions. And Ding played a very quiet continuation here. Moves like bishop g5 are you know, the most common move here, most con common continuation. He just played bishop f4, which doesn't put really any pressure on black center. And this is certainly not um, a highly theoretical continuation. Aronian played these very sensible moves, and after the bishop claims this diagonal, black, to my mind, has equalized straight away. Black is doing absolutely fine here. And Ding's piece development is very modest indeed. And here, well, to me, that a natural move would be to exchange off this powerful bishop, just to play bishop d6. After this trade, I don't think black has any difficulties at all. It's a classic kind of Queen's Gambit exchange um, variation position where everything has gone right for black with that wonderful bishop on f5. Instead, Aronian played the bishop back. A modest move, I think too modest. And now Ding starts to get something in the position. Aronian doesn't need to give up the two bishops, that's, that's another matter. Um, but still, he has a strong defensive formation here. Still doesn't look too serious, although white has bishops, black's structure is very pleasant. And now a5, I wonder whether Aronian should have played a5 here. I, I mean, just developing with knight d7 looks more prudent to me. Anyway, a5, and now Ding started to go for it on the other side of the board. Clearly nothing is happening on the queen side for white, but g4 is a very dangerous move. Just gaining space, and Ding takes advantage of the fact that the queen is on the other side of the board to gain space. That pawn on g5 does an excellent job of taking away the f6 square from black's pieces. And now e4. So opening up the position for the bishops looks very logical indeed. And here, um, well, Aronian could bring the queen back. This might be the most prudent move. Hitting this pawn. That can be held, of course, with h4. And now just knight b6. Although it allows e5, white has a lot of space here. This is dangerous. But the knight can swing around here and maybe... Black gets some counterplay on the queen side. Playable position, I would say, for black. Instead, Aronian took on e4, which, um, well, it was clear that he'd overlooked something here. And afterwards, he admitted that his first intention was knight c7 to bring the knight here, or perhaps e6. But then knight c5 is a very nasty move. He'd simply forgotten about this tactic. If knight takes, and now bishop c7 wins a piece because the, the bishop on c5 is hanging. So he had to double back with his queen, keeping an eye here, h4, securing that pawn, and now knight b6. So at least he's bringing his knight to a nice central square, but you can see that bishop stands beautifully on e5 can't be driven away this would be absolutely fatal it would open up black's king and now there's a nice winning move knight g5 opening up this diagonal that's fatal actually so for the moment Aronian had to play um, knight d5 and now another excellent move from ding bishop g4 so those bishops just are raking across the board, that bishop claiming an excellent diagonal here. And this is a very unpleasant position. So if Aronian plays like a normal move, knight d6, knight c5 just puts a little bit more pressure on black's position, looking at these very nice squares. So Aronian, well, he, he invested a lot of time here. 
Um, played king h8, which looks very bizarre. And Ding built with rook ae1, building up nicely. And here Aronian clearly felt that if he sat there, he would just be outplayed. I should say at this time that clock situation was around about five minutes for Aronian. Ding had 20 minutes, a huge time advantage. But Aronian gambled. Knight f6. Now, if he can trade a minor piece, fine. But let's see what happened. Of course, this can be taken. And here, Ding played the bishop back to h2. He played this very quickly. But if he'd perhaps spent a little bit longer, he might have found queen c1. And this is a really powerful move. Obviously, uh, with the threat of queen h6 and some kind of devastating uh, attack on the king side. So you can play king h7 or king g7. Well, if king g7, which looks, you know, possible. Now, of course, black can't play on a piece down here. This is the point. The bishop goes back and now you play f, beg your pardon, f5, forking two pieces. But here, with the king on g7, white is in control. Knight check. Now king to the side and a rook check. But here white is a pawn up. That knight is on a fantastic square. White's piece is looking very good. That must be good for white. King h7 is perhaps a bit trickier, but still very promising for white. So we give a piece back this way. That has to be taken. And now simply king g2. And there is a really, really powerful attack on the h-file, threatening a mate, of course. So black has to play f6. And now, well, white simply has a really strong attack here. Um, it, this bishop is just a monster. Moves like rook h6 are happening. White has a great attack there. But... Ding played bishop h2, so Aronian has to recover the piece with f5. Ding gave back the piece and played queen d1. He could still play knight g3 there, which isn't too bad, but queen d1. So with the idea of queen h5, but after this check, king goes in the corner and perhaps Ding underestimated the power of this move rook g4 excellent move shutting out the queen and also allowing the rook to both defend and attack so we have a very similar position to the one we just looked at with the knight on f5 but now there's no h pawn and that rook is on a fantastic square defending the king but also attacking white's king and suddenly the game has turned and here, well, rook e5 still looks very dangerous for black, but in fact, Aronian comes up with an excellent move. Knight f5, in spite of being very short of time, he played this phase extremely well. So if that knight is taken, then the queen comes out to h4. Ding should probably move his queen in, but this endgame well, is, let's just say it's very comfortable for black. Black won't be worse there. But instead, Ding played rook e1, and this was a fatal error. After queen h4, there is no decent defense. I'm afraid Ding just collapsed. I guess that after rook e8 check, he'd been only looking at rook takes and you know maybe something like queen g1, and this is still a bit tricky. But in fact, after rook e8, simply king g7 and this is a winning move so this is still a threat rook g1 check and now king f6 and here ding had to resign because the rook is on prees as well as this mate queen h2 so there we go a convincing victory for levon aronin in the tie breaks by two to zero he has had a fantastic tournament clearly well let me just list some of the players he's beaten to get through to this finish he beat in the second round Ho Yifan, Matlakov, 
in the in the third round, Dubov in the fourth round. So he's beaten, you know, two utter up and coming Russians there in rounds three and four. He beat Ivanchuk in round five, so one of the old guards. He beat Maxim Vashi Legrav, well, on form, a real form player who's uh, you know playing fantastic chess this year. And in the final, he beat Ding Liren. Um, well, also a, a fantastic player, three-time Chinese champion. So a deserved victory from Levon Aronian. And as I said at the beginning, that's the second time he has won the FIDE World Cup. Uh, the first time, 2005, a gap of 12 years. Levon is on superb form this year. He came first in the Grenka Chess Classic in April. He came first in the Norway Chess Tournament. And in St. Louis, well, he didn't win the, the classical tournament, but he did win the Blitz and Rapid Play event. So congratulations to him. And it has been a fantastic few weeks. If, you do, if you've enjoyed watching these videos, don't forget you can subscribe. Just click on the subscribe button. And um, well, if you would like to support this channel, then please do have a look at patreon.com powerplay chess and check out the rewards there. Thanks everyone for watching. Thanks for all your comments.